All right, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, coming to our conference once again. I hope everybody had a good lunch. Nice break. Stretch your legs. We'll get the party started again. So I think a lot of you probably know me already. <laughs> Movement disorder specialist at the Neuromedical Center. Um, I'm going to talk today about treatment of Parkinson's disease, um, but really just treatment of the motor symptoms. Um, you know, there's a whole host of other non motor symptoms that Dr. Kader is going to get into, uh, talking about those and how they might treat those. I'm going to stick to treating the movement symptoms, and also I'll talk about deep brain stimulation too. May even have a surprise guest. Um, so when I refer to motor symptoms, I'm really talking about the tremor, the stiffness, the slowness, and to a lesser extent, the walking and balance issues. Um, and the way that we treat that primarily is with medications. Uh, but I want to emphasize non-pharmacologic, non-drug therapies are extremely important. Um, I think just as important, um, you, I think a lot of you heard me emphasize this, how, how important exercise is in Parkinson's disease. And uh, I try and tell everybody, you know, do some kind of cardiovascular exercise, uh, do some kind of stretching or, or something like tai chi, tai chi or yoga or Pilates. Uh, all these things are vital. And um, I see in my clinic, and this is confirmed in the clinical trials that people who are the most active do the best. It seems to almost slow the disease down. Uh, and I, like I said, I see in my practice the people who are very active do a lot better, and that's just that's just a fact. So um, I don't want to imply by this talk that you know the only thing we do is medicines and, and surgery. That's, that's uh, definitely not true. So I mentioned the. Four major, four major motor symptoms, and there's a little acronym trap to help to help remember those. Um, I'll just point out here that with the with the P, the postural instability and poor balance, uh, that particular motor symptom does not respond nearly as well to the medicines as as the other motor symptoms here: the tremor, the stiffness, and the slowness. And throughout my talk, I'm going to refer to um, these terms at the bottom, and they're, and they're kind of complicated terms, um, motor fluctuations um, and, and, and dyskinesia. So uh, what I mean by that is, you know, after a while that you've been on the, the uh, medicines and, and they've worked well for some time, a number of years, but then a lot of people with Parkinson's, the medicines don't last as long as they used to, and you have to take them more frequently because they wear off. So that's the terminology we use when the medicine's not working. We call that the off state. And when your medicines are working well, uh, then we call that the on state. So off and on, um, off is bad, on is good. Uh, that's the terminology we use. And then um, the other major motor complication besides the on and off fluctuations is dyskinesias. And those are the involuntary, fidgety, movements that some people with Parkinson's get. You've probably seen Michael J. Fox in interviews um, having these dyskinesias. Um, you know, not everybody gets these complications, by the way, but, but the longer you live with Parkinson's, the, the more likely it is to begin to occur. So we really talked about this already. The motor fluctuations, you can start to get wearing off. Um, and for a number of years when that starts to happen, you can kind of predict when you when the medicine is going to wear off, how long it's going to last. But after after a certain number of years, it can even start to catch you by surprise and it can be unpredictable. Um, or it can happen extremely suddenly. Um, and then what can also happen is that uh, you can have a dose failure, which means that you, you take the medicine and it just doesn't seem to work for that particular instance and um, you feel like you didn't even take anything. Um, so all, all these things are more likely to happen, unfortunately, as time goes on. You see this stat here. Um, you know, half the people have these different kind of motor fluctuations after, after several years. 
Um, and then dyskinesia, I talked about that. That's when the people get people get fidgeting movements, and it's 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 not like one day you have none, the next day you have these severe ones. It's it's, it's really a continuum and a spectrum. And when they start, they're they're very subtle, and you probably won't even notice them. Um, it might just be that you you know tap your foot a lot, or you can't sit still. Uh, you might just look a little bit fidgety. Um, and that really doesn't bother people at first. In fact, dyskinesias don't really bother people until they, you know, become severe. But they can be painful, and they and they can they can cause a lot of problems and disability, obviously. Um, and, and there's other type of movements besides the fidgety movements. People can get a dystonia as well. That's um, I'm sure some of you have had um, cramps in your toes in the morning. Uh, that can be painful or it, other parts of the body can can cramp up too, and that can be related to the medicine either being a too high a level or or too low of a level. So our treatment goals are going to be to maximize the part of the day when the medicine's working, right? I mean, so we're going to we want to keep you in the on state longer, and consequently, the flip side of that is we want to keep you. Um, we want to minimize the amount of off time that you have. So basically more good time and less bad time. And sometimes that's easier said than done. Um, as, as time goes on, it becomes increasingly difficult to keep people in that, in that good zone. So I want to talk about medicines first. Um, the, the best medicine by far, the most potent medicine by far, is levodopa. And most of you know that as uh, carbidopa, levodopa, or cinnamet. Um, if you're on Stilevo, by the way, Cinemet is in Stilevo, which is also a third medication in, in that particular formulation, and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But levodopa is the, the, the foundation um, that's a precursor to dopamine. So when you take a pill that contains levodopa, you're, it's absorbed in the intestine, it's um, transported to the brain, and your brain turns it into dopamine. And that's the neurotransmitter that's deficient in Parkinson's disease, like, like Dr. Standard pointed out. So we're basically replacing exactly the neurotransmitter that's deficient. And because it's really the exact thing that's missing, it's, it's, the, best, it's the best medicine, really. I mean, it's, it's the most potent because it's the real thing. All these other medicines I'm talking about, they're, they're really synthetic variants of dopamine, if you will. They, they stimulate the receptors, but it's not the real thing. That can have advantages and disadvantages. We'll talk about that. But since it's the real thing, it's the most potent therapy. The problem is, the only problem is, is that the, cinema, the levodopa compared to the other medicines more likely to cause these fluctuations that I just talked about than the other medicines. The other medicines can do them, but levodopa tends to do it sooner rather than later. And so if you, um, you rely on cinemet, is your only medicine, um, then you can get these on and off fluctuations, these dyskinesias, they'll, they'll come sooner rather than later. And that's been proven by, by many clinical trials. So what we want to do, we, we, we think the reason that people get these fluctuations and dyskinesias is because we're giving the medicine in a, in a pulsatile fashion. In other words, you take the medicine, the level goes up in your blood, your liver breaks it down, level, level goes down, you take another dose, so your level of the medicine is seesawing up and down all day. And that's not the way the brain um, releases dopamine naturally. The, the brain does it in a continuous manner. Um, so we think this pulsatile stimulation for years and years that we do um, primes the subcortical structures to cause these fluctuations, troublesome fluctuations. And so we try to incorporate strategies that try to keep the level in the blood as steady as possible. And we think that does people good in the long run in, in terms of pushing these fluctuations further out in the future or maybe even preventing them, hopefully. So um, that's the pros and cons of uh, cinnamon. By the way, the carbidopa that's in the tablet doesn't do anything at all for the Parkinson's. But it's very important because levodopa by itself um, not only goes to the part of the brain where you lose it in Parkinson's, but it also goes to the nausea center of the brain. And so it directly stimulates the nausea center of the brain. That's why nausea is one of the main side effects. So we learned a long time ago that we have to give it with this carbidopa because it 
it forces more of it in the brain and less of it in the periphery where it can cause the nausea. And uh, actually, cinemet means in Latin without emesis or without vomiting. So it literally means, you know, it doesn't make you vomit. So uh, interesting tidbit there. The, and, I'm, and I'm going to go through these medicines in the, in the, in the order of potency. So, so, so levodopa is the best pound for pound medicine for, for Parkinson's, but there's reasons we might not want to take that right away, so we've established that. And then there's the next class of medicines that is probably the next strongest, if you will, and that's the dopamine agonists. And I only listed two here, but there's really four. This is an old slide, a uh, very old slide. Um, so the two main ones that we know about are uh, primaprexol and ropinirole. There used to be a lot more that were taken off the market because of the side effects. I won't even talk about those. You, you can't even get them anymore. But the Mirapex and the Requip, um, very good medicines. They're kind of like a synthetic dopamine. It stimulates the receptors. Uh, works well, lasts longer than the levodopa, which is a good thing. The problem is um, they really have more side effects pound for pound compared to levodopa. So you're more likely to get nausea, more likely to get confusion, dyskinesias, uh, all these other symptoms listed here. And so um, for younger people with, with Parkinson's, they can usually get away with not having these side effects. But in older people, they tend to get a lot more of these side effects, and that may be why, you know, if you're if you're older, you may not be on these, and that's probably why. Um, and the other two dopamine agonists that are not listed here is one of which is the patch, roticotine patch or Nupro patch. It's very similar to Mirapex and Requip in terms of the of the of the compound. The, the difference is the delivery system. It's it's a patch, so it's a transdermal delivery system. It's absorbed right into the bloodstream. Doesn't go through the gut at all, which is very good. It keeps the levels very steady. Um, and so that's that's definitely an advantage. Um, now there are extended release versions of Mirapex and Requip, so that those are only once a day too. So um, we have these strategies to to try to keep the levels more or less steady, and that's a good thing if you can tolerate them and if you can afford them. So cost is an issue as well. The fourth dopamine agonist on the market is, a, is an injection. Um, to be honest, I, I have hundreds of Parkinson's patients, probably half of y'all here today, and I don't think I have a single person on the, on the injection. It's called apokine or apomorphine is the generic name. It's tremendously expensive, and um, the, the idea is when, you're, when you freeze up, and your, and your uh, medicines aren't working, you can inject this. It's like a rescue. It's supposed to work very fast, very potent, but um, the cost is a major, major issue. And when you're frozen, it's hard to uh, manipulate this injection thing. So it, it, it really is not very practical. And uh, I, I, th I think it's better to try to prevent those spells as much as possible than anything. MAOB inhibitors, um, there's, there's a couple on the market. There's rosagiline, which is Azelex, and there's selegiline, which is Eldapril. Also, there's another formulation of it, um, a Zytus formulation, uh, that, um, that dissolves under the tongue, and the name's escaping me at this time. Um, but these medicines, what they do is they um, take the dopamine that our body makes and makes it last longer. So it inhibits the breakdown of the natural dopamine and if you take in levodopa, it inhibits the breakdown of that as well. So um, it, these, these medicines do work by themselves, but when you combine them with levodopa, they work even better. Um, so, uh, but just like you know the other non-levodopa preparations, pound for pound, they do have a little bit more side effects, uh, and they're and they're listed here. Um, but, 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 but these two medicines are nice because they're either uh, once a day or twice a day medicines. And like I said, they can work as an adjunct with the other therapies. Uh, these medicines have been shown to reduce, um, they're, they're, they're uh, indicated for, to be taken by themselves in early Parkinson's and they're also indicated later on to be taken with other medicines like Cinemet to reduce the amount of off time you have, reduce the amount of dyskinesias you have. But if you're not careful how you give it, it can actually make it worse. And that's where uh, hopefully our uh, expertise comes in. It can be very tricky. 
I just want to go back one second. I forgot to mention something about the dopamine agonist that I think is very important. The Mirapex, the Requip, the Nupro, they all have a couple of black box warnings on the label that I always try to tell my patients about. Um, one of the black box warnings is about falling asleep at the wheel suddenly. It's rare, but it's obviously very dangerous. So um, that's something definitely tell your doctor about if you're having that. And then the other black box warning on these medications is about um, impulse control disorders, which can take several different forms, but primarily the most common manifestation of that is that it can make you gamble a little bit, uh, which we have a lot of that availability around here, poker machines and boats and stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of funny, but it's, but it's really not. Some people have, you know, <laughs> lost a lot of money their uh, life savings uh, this way, so please tell your doctor if, if anything like that's going on. But besides gambling, it can also make people kind of go on shopping sprees. It can call, it, it can it can cause uh, you know sexual impulsive behavior. So you have to be careful about these kind of things. Um, sorry to jump back and forth there a little bit, um, but uh, these two medicines have have some warnings too about interactions with other medicines, especially high doses of antidepressants and certain pain medications. So be sure if you're on that um, that you're aware of these, and I, I give all my patients a handout that says, you know, if you're on these medicines, don't take these medicines. So, because uh, it can be kind of confusing and, you know, y'all can't remember all that. It's hard for me to. We have the next class of medicines called the COMPT inhibitors, and uh, there's there's really only one now, uh, COMPTAN or Intacapone. You can take it as a separate pill uh, or it's com combined with Cinemed, and that's called Salivo. I'm sure a lot of you know about this. Um, so what the Comptan does when you take it with levodopa is it, it makes the levodopa last longer with every dose. And that's why, it's, that's why you take it at the same time. Um, so it's been shown in the studies. It gives people an extra hour or two of on, good on time per day compared to people who aren't on it. Uh, but again, you've got to be careful how you give it because it can actually push you into having dyskinesias if, if you're not using it just right. So you got to be careful about that. Um, one thing about the intacapone is that it, it does does color the urine a little bit. So that's something um, I forget to mention sometimes, but um, it's something peop sometimes people mention and, and kind of bothers them. But it's not a, it's not an issue. It's supposed to do that. And uh, also about five or five or ten percent of the time, compound can can cause diarrhea that won't go away. Uh, so that's something that sometimes people neglect to mention because it doesn't seem like a neurologic problem, but that medicine can do that. And then you have a, you have a, a few other medications that are that are really um, not used as much because they're they're not nearly as potent and they have a lot more side effects. Anticholinergics is one of them. Um, Artane or trihexyphenidyl is the main one that I use. I think a lot of other people use that one too. Uh, it, it's not bad for tremor control, it, but it doesn't work so well on the other motor symptoms and tends to cause a lot of side effects. But if you're trying to minimize the amount of other Parkinson's medicines that somebody's on, this sometimes is appropriate. But it tends to cause dry mouth, constipation, uh, dry eyes, uh, and confusion, even uh, hallucinations. So that's that. And then there's amantadine which um, is actually an old medicine that is one of the first medicines used to treat the flu, influenza virus, and they happened to notice that people who had influenza virus infection and got treated with this, if they had Parkinson's, it you know, helped them. So um, this drug really hits a lot of different receptors and that's, and that's kind of how it works. Uh, we don't really know exactly, I think, the extent of how it works, but it, but it does help a little bit. Um, but like some of the other things I mentioned, it tends to cause more side effects pound for pound than other medicines, and it's just it's just not that potent. Not many people can stay on this very long by itself to control their disease. It also is about the only medicine that's good to treat dyskinesias, um, you know, without making everything else worse. So if you have an, if I'm having a hard time controlling dyskinesias, we might try to add this medication. And now um, I'll talk about uh, deep brain stimulation. I think a lot of you are anxious to hear about this. And this is um, 
an exciting therapy, but not so new, but it's an FDA-approved therapy for Parkinson's disease and some other diseases. And what um, we'll talk about um, who is a good candidate for deep brain stimulation, what's involved with it, you know, what are the side effects, what's the inclusion, exclusion criteria. Uh, we'll talk about all that stuff. You can see it's been FDA approved for Parkinson's since 1997, so that's 15 years. It's been out quite a while. It's been being, being done all over the world, but um, was not done in Baton Rouge until the Neuromedical Center recruited me to come here. That's probably the main reason they recruited me, because I had that specialty training from UAB, and, and I brought that here. We got a program started here. I've been doing it here five years now, and um, we're real excited about it. The, the two main um, things that I use to use it for in Baton Rouge is for Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. It's also approved for something called dystonia, um, but it's only in a very rare case it might be used for that. And they're looking at deep brain stimulation for a lot of other things now, like um, severe depression, obsessive compulsive disease, uh, morbid obesity, Tourette's, a lot of other things, pain, chronic pain. Um, so it's being looked at in a lot of things, but still the vast majority of people who have this technology uh, they have either Parkinson's or essential trauma. And I'd say here it's about 50-50. About half the patients I implant have Parkinson's and the other half have essential trauma. So you may benefit from this technology. Uh, the patented name for it is Activa. That's what Medtronic calls it. But this Activa deep brain stimulation system is only good for certain patients with Parkinson's disease. It really is only for people who have regular Parkinson's disease and not the atypical ones that Dr. Lee was talking about. Um, it, it's for people with Parkinson's disease who have responded very well to the medications for many years and then they start to have these on and off fluctuations that become troublesome, these dyskinesias that become troublesome. Um, and so those are the perfect patients for this. Okay. Now this this graph, um, really if you understand this graph, then you understand a lot about Parkinson's and, and I'll try and explain it real quick for you guys, but um, if you can imagine this line here going up, uh, as, as this line goes up, you have increasing level of cinematic in your blood after you take, take a pill. So um, let's go to this before line. So this is somebody who has fairly advanced Parkinson's. They, they fluctuate a lot. They, they take their pill and the medicine starts to kick in, and when they reach this magic line, they go from being in the off state to the on state. So they go from feeling bad to good. But then the level keeps going up, and when it reaches this level, then people start to get the fidgeties, the, the dyskinesias. So then the medicine starts to wear off, they stay in fidgety, and then they come back down, and they're in a good spot again. So from here to here, they're, they're doing okay, but look how this is not very much time. This, so this, x-axis is time. So this really isn't much time that they're in this good spot. Uh, it's, it's basically, you know, from here to here. Um, and then, um, and a lot of this is spent having dyskinesias. So the, the only good time they have is in this small area and in this small area. And then they're back in the off state here. Now after they get deep brain stimulation, this is how their life changes. So now they still fluctuate and they still have some off time, they still have some dyskinesia time. But look how much more percentage of the time they spend in this in this in this good zone here. So, and you can understand this graph being repeated seven or eight times in a day. Um, this difference can add up to be quite significant. So, what I always tell people is, um, when your medicines are working the best, deep brain stimulation won't make your life better than that. The quality won't be better than that. But that time, that part of the day will be longer, not better. And that's the number one takeaway point. DBS won't make your good time better, it'll make it longer. So if you weren't running a marathon when the medicines were working, then you're, then you're not going to be running a marathon with DBS. So it, it doesn't improve your on, it doesn't improve the quality of your on time, just the quantity. So we talked about the people who um, are, uh, or eligible for this have these complications. Uh, or sometimes we do it for people who we try all the medicines and they really just can't take enough of the medicines to treat their symptoms. Um, that's a little bit more of a leap of faith. Um, but, but we do do it for 
those people sometimes. Um, but, but really, we'd like to see that people do respond because then we'll know they will respond to the stimulator. If people don't respond to the medicine, then the stimulator will not help you either. And that's a very important point. This slide is kind of busy, but it, but it really just kind of talks about um, you have really a, a window of opportunity to get deep brain stimulation. Um, when, you, when you're early on in the disease, you know, you've only been on one or two medicines. You're not really having these complications yet. You don't really need it because if you're not having them, it's not going to change your life if you get it. Um, and then you have this window of opportunity when you have these, these fluctuations and we can give the stimulator to reduce those complications. But then there, there does come a time in most people when the window closes and the window closes when, when really when the medicine, even when you do take it, it doesn't really work that well anymore. And don't forget that the stimulator won't work any better than the medicine. So if the medicine's not working even for short periods of time, then the stimulator probably won't, won't help you at that point. And there are some other contraindications I'm about to get into. The actual hardware that is involved is a lead in the brain, of course, and I'll, and I'll show you where that is in the next couple slides. But the lead um, is through a little hole that we drill in the skull, and uh, under anesthesia, of course, it doesn't hurt. And the, and the wires are under the skin, and they go behind the ear, and usually the wires go down to a little battery-like device implanted in the chest wall. Looks really just like a pacemaker. It's called a battery or a pulse generator. And it delivers low voltage, high frequency electric pulses to these specific deep parts of the brain. We don't know exactly how it works, but it over we think it overrides the abnormal rhythms that are driving a lot of these motor symptoms. And we have some different kind of batteries we can put in. There's there's one kind of battery where it only goes to one side of the brain, and there's uh, most of the new batteries are. Um, have, you can do both sides and they can plug both into the same battery. And I can program them through the skin with a little handheld computer. And so here's what um, my program looks like in clinic. I'm sure a lot of you know what this looks like. Uh, and then this is what the battery looks like and here's the wires. And um, there's another slide that shows this better, but there's four little contacts at the end of this wire that go right through the structure that we want it to be. And then patients have a little programmer that they can use to turn it off and on if they need to, although most Parkinson's patients just keep it on all the time. Some of the newer programmers actually you know, allow the patients to have some programming capabilities themselves if the doctor allows it. And um, it's nice to have that in, in case you think something's wrong with the stimulator, you can always just turn it off, you know, so that's a good thing about it. And, and the other good thing about it from, from a doctor's point of view is that it's adjustable, you know, so we can we can adjust the settings. And there's there's other variables too. There's there's pulse width and frequency, and, and there's different leads. There's there's about a million different you know combinations of parameters that we can set, so we can tailor the size and shape and strength of the magnetic field to tailor your exact needs. And that may change over time, and we can modulate it and change the shape and size and density of, of the field to exactly what you need. <laughs> It's just a little bit about what it looks like. Um, there's a little, this is, this is somebody getting the procedure. Um, they're awake. Um, now, th in this slide here, this person has a metal frame attached to their head, but we don't use, we don't do it that way here. We use a, what's called a frameless technology, which is, which is newer. And it, in, instead of having this metal frame bolted to your head, um, we can do it with a camera that, that is off to the side that, that really looks at these tiny little screws that, that we put in that, that can do the same thing as the frame. So it's, it's a lot more comfortable for the patient and just as precise. Kind of hard to see, but this slide shows exactly what part of the brain that we're going in. And for Parkinson's disease, it's called the subthalamic nucleus, or we can also use another structure called the globus pallidus internus. But here we primarily do um, subthalamic nucleus, and this is it right here. Um, it's really deep in the brain. That's, that's called deep brain stimulation. It's at a point where my fingers would kind of touch. Okay, it's 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 deep in there, and so um, because it's and it's only a structure about the size of my fingernail here. So um, since it's deep and small, 
it requires very precise targeting methods to make sure that we're in exactly the right place. And that's also the reason why patients are awake for the procedure so that when we're putting the lead into the brain, we can listen to the brain waves, we can see the pattern of the firing, uh, can actually have the patients um, move their arm and leg on the other side of their body a little bit and it modulates or changes the way the neurons fire. It helps me precisely locate what part of the brain we need to be in. And when I'm confident we're in the right part of the brain by the way the brain waves are and from the patient's response, then we do a little, we do a little um, simulation right there while the patient's awake. I want to make sure that when I turn it on, it's going to help their symptoms, obviously. And I also want to make sure, more importantly, that it's not going to cause any side effects that I don't want. Because if it's not in the right part of the brain exactly, if it's a little bit off to the side in either direction, it can stimulate an unwanted structure that can cause a problem. So I want to make sure that I'm going to be able to use it. I want to make sure that it's going to be in the right spot. And this is just a, a, a cartoon of a um, of these structures in the brain. And this is the subthalamic nucleus here. It's just kind of the shape of it. And when this dotted line is kind of the trajectory that we usually take through it. And this shows what the recordings look like when we're in the right part of the brain. So when we're in the FTN, uh, it just makes a certain sound. It's unmistakable. But Kadiri knows what I'm talking about. Um, some of you know what I'm talking about, too. You all heard it. Uh, there's several people here with deep brain stimulation from us. Um, this is another slide kind of showing the, the target structure. Here's the STN, which we use for Parkinson's. Here's the other one that we can use for Parkinson's, but we don't do that here. And then if you get it for essential tremor, it's in this a certain part of the thalamus, which is actually right above the STN. I think I talked about all this already. This is a, just a close-up of the, what is actually uh, in the brain through the structure. We use this one. This is another one you can do where the leaves are closer together, but I use this one here. Um, and these contacts are 1.5 millimeters apart, and they're 1.5 mil, uh, millimeters long each. So we can stimulate um, a span that's 10.5 millimeters, and the actual structure itself is more like six. So I like having, there's at least one of those leaves going to be through it, or hopefully two of them, and then maybe one on top and one on bottom, just as a precaution. Uh, safety factor, if you will, in case the lead migrates a little bit, we can still use it. So I think that's important. So after you get this procedure, um, you, you're awake for the procedure. Now when I finish doing the, putting the lead in the brain, then we, let, then we do put people to sleep. And then Dr. Wagaspak, who I should mention is a neurosurgeon who does it with us at the Neuromedical Center uh, and does a fabulous job. After we do our part, he, he continues his part, and then he puts you to sleep and puts all the wires that, that, that you'll uh, need in um, and gets all the wires ready. And then you go right to the observation room after. We just watch people overnight in the hospital, get a CAT scan in the morning, and they usually go home. A couple of weeks later, they'll come back and actually get the battery put in as a separate procedure. But that's a real quick and easy one-day surgery type procedure in and out in a few hours. And then it's still off. The system is still off at this point. A couple weeks later, people see me in the clinic, and then I program it right in the clinic for the first time. Um, and then it usually takes several sessions to kind of gradually bring the settings up to where they need to be. And as, we, as we're doing that slow titration of the settings, we'll sometimes have to adjust medications uh, accordingly because Hopefully, we will be able to go down the medicines, but that should not be the reason that you get the stimulator. Um, it's nice when that happens, um, and when you, if you have both sides put in, then um, which we do one side of the brain at a time. So some people need the other side of the brain done, and they'll get that done, you know, months or years down the road when they want or need it. But when you get both sides put in, that's when you really have a chance of coming down on on the uh, medicine. For a lot of people. It's, it's hard to come down a lot on the medicine after, after just having one side put in. But there is a gentleman here, uh, Mr. Boggs, uh, right there. So Mr. Boggs recently was one of the implants that we did. And he had a fabulous um, operating session. We got, a, we got a great recording. Time to applause, Mr. Boggs. 
So Mr. Boggs actually was taking, I think, 15 Cinemet tablets a day. He was taking them multiple, multiple times a day. And I told him the same thing I'm telling y'all here today. And, and he went through the procedure. And he comes back. And, you know, being the engineer that he is, he's got it all laid out. You know, he's tried different things. And he managed to get down to two or four tablets a day. And either once or twice a day, and, and even I was taken aback at, at his dramatic response. But he's been he's been quite pleased, and cutting down to some other medicines too. So he's uh, he's really done well, and and that, and that can happen. But that's not that's not every case. Um, so I just want to point that out too. Talked about all that already. Talked about that already. Let's talk about risk because, you know, I, I can in good faith tell you about all the good things it does and not tell you about some of the risks associated with the procedure. Um, the main risks are uh, bleeding and infection and seizures, and those are the big three. Um, this percentages here I think are a little high. I, I really don't think our numbers are that high at all. Um, I've done 120 here. We've only had one case of bleeding on the brain, so that's 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 way less than this, but I don't want to sugarcoat these side effects too much um, because these are published and, you know, this, this, this may be um, upwards of what it could be. So um, these are some of the things that can happen. Um, but we take great pains when we're planning the procedure to go through a trajectory in the brain to avoid blood vessels, which minimizes the risks of bleeding and seizures. Those are the main uh, bad things that we worry about. Um, even if there is the bleeding in the brain, a lot of those people, um, you find the bleeding later by accident and, and it does, didn't even cause a problem. We sort of found it by accident just because we routinely monitor people with uh, scans. So um, not, all the, not all the bleeding causes, causes a major problem, but these things can happen. You can get side effects from stimulation, but the good news is we can, we can avoid that by, you know, turning it down or, or changing the parameters. Uh, that's why um, I like to be the one to do the recording myself. You know, not, not all doctors who do this, they actually go and do the recording themselves in the operating room, but I do that myself. I do my own programming, so I know what I got going into it, and um, that I think avoids a lot of these stimulation side effects that people get because I know where it is and I know what I can and can't do in the clinic in terms of programming. People always ask about insurance coverage. It is very expensive, as you can imagine, but it is covered by all insurances. Um, I almost never um, have a, a patient with Medicare or any other kind of insurance. I've never had a denial. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's approved. You know, it's, it's not some radical new thing that's experimental. So it's standard of care for these patients. It really is. Uh, but everybody's insurance plan is a little different. You may have a higher copay than somebody else. I can't speak about the particulars of your plan. But I can tell you that, in general, it is covered. And no, I don't know if Obamacare is going to change that. Um, so let's talk a little bit more. Uh, this is just a slide about the history, and, and this is technical. But before we did the deep brain stimulation, they, they used to actually burn a hole in the brain in the same place and cause a little stroke. And we used to call that that up the thalamotomies or uh, subthalamotomies. And um, that would work, but it, you couldn't change it if you burn the wrong place. Oops, now you have a permanent, you know, side effect or stroke. Um, or if it did work, it only worked temporarily because you couldn't adjust it or turn it up like, like we came with the stimulator. So that's just the precursor of deep brain stimulation, um, but it led us to where we are today. These are just some of the other things it's, it's not approved for, but it's being used for deep brain stimulation. Um, I talked a little bit about this, but this is important enough to mention again that the people who um, are good candidates are the people with the motor complications, but, but you also, um, you, you can't have dementia. I mean, you can't have severe memory problems because then studies show that A, it makes the memory worse in that situation, and B, it doesn't really improve the quality of life. So it's, it's, not, it's not a good idea to do in those situations, but we screen for that. You know, in every single case we do, we have neuropsychologists as part of our team at the Neuromedical Center, and we send people there and we screen for all these contraindications to make sure that people don't have these issues going into it. We also screen for uh, severe depression, 
severe mood disorders, things like that, that, that can also be a contraindication. And of course, medical conditions. We get medical clearance to make sure you're, you know, you're okay from a, from a heart point of view. Um, your general doctor has to clear you. So if you have a severe medical disorder, sometimes that, you know, keeps people from getting it. Um, we talked about the advantages. It's, it's not destructive. You know, you can always turn it off or alter the settings. Um, but then we, you know, it is, it is expensive. It takes multiple procedures. You can have hardware complications. Sometimes this uh, pulse generator can be, you know, uncomfortable or cause pain. Uh, it's not that common, but it can happen. Um, some, some thin women don't like having the wires, you know, showing. Sometimes they can show if, if, if somebody's thin. Um, you know, we've had guys who like to shoot guns, and so, you know, they don't like the battery here. Then we've got to put it on the other side, and they stop shooting anyway, and we make... I'll tease them about it later anyway. Um, we talk about these complications. And I think I also talked about this, how we don't really understand how it works. We think it jams up the fiber somehow. Um, but um, all we know is that it, it does work. And um, that's the end of my talk.